All right, everyone. We're going to get started. Thanks so much for being here today at our seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Um, this is a hybrid event. And so we have folks online and folks in the room. For folks that are online, just a reminder that your cameras, mics, and screen shares are turned off. But if you have any questions, technical or for our speaker, please use the chat function in Zoom and our uh, volunteer, Roseanne, will read them out to our speaker and we'll make sure we get those questions answered. For folks in the room, just a reminder, when we get to the question and answer section, if you raise your hand, I'll bring you a mic and that way folks online can hear our questions and interact with us as well. Um, but mostly I just wanna say thank you and make a couple of quick announcements and get us started with today's talk. So the main announcement, Marine Science Day. Yeah. Um, so Marine Science Day is Saturday. Uh, many folks in the room are actually going to be presenters at that exhibit. Um, but for folks that are not or folks that are online, um, please come and join us. We have a huge open house on Saturday from 10 to 4. It's a free event where we have nearly 50 exhibitors, uh, researchers putting out their best show and tells for us to play with and explore. Um, so it's a really exciting day and it's a big day for us. So I hope you come. Um, I also just wanted to apologize. We had a little bit of a glitch with our calendaring system. And so today's speaker was listed for next week and next week's speaker was listed for today. Um, but so just a little reminder that next week um, we actually have Roxanne Bellatron from the University of California, Santa Cruz, who will be um, joining us to talk about open ocean ecology and how it shapes life history of long lived animals. This particular speaker will be remote, but we'll have on-site and remote viewing options. So feel free to join us here um, in the room and get cookies and coffees like normal, um, but she will be still in California for this particular talk. Um, so if you have any questions about our upcoming events or you would like to see the recordings, you can go to the HMSC homepage, scroll to the bottom, there's a calendar of events there so you can get all the details you might need but for today. I would like to introduce Jessica Garwood, who's an assistant professor of CEOs at Oregon State University with a lab here at Hatfield. She has a bachelor's and a master's from Dalhousen, Dal, Dalhousen, Dalhousie, see? Hmm. When I read out loud, then I have trouble. Um, <laughs> University and her PhD from Scripps. She also had postdoctoral positions both at Princeton and Rutgers um, before she joined us here at Hatfield and OSU. Uh, Jessica's research interests focus on small-scale physical and biological interactions in the ocean, and especially their implication on the transport of plankton and sediment. And so I'm really excited to see what Jessica has for us today. So I'm going to hand it off to you. Go ahead and make it go green. <clears throat> well, thank you, Cinnamon, and thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, if you were here for Roxanne, feel free to leave early. <laughs> this will be a bit different. But if you stay to the end, Joe has told me we'll have a, a happy hour after this seminar. So you should also join that event. Um, some of you may have seen some of this seminar, um, but hopefully there will be some new material in there for you too. Um, so the outline of the talk today, I'll cover the importance of coastal transport pathways, the influence that larval swimming behavior can have, um, two examples from depth keeping in internal waves and sinking or swimming up in an estuary, and some future direction uh, with new applications of technology um, that will also feature Joe. I am someone who walks around and gesticulates a lot, so if I step outside of the blue box, please boo loudly and I will return to behind the screen so people uh, online can see me and not just my forehead. Um, so as many of you in the room know, changing ocean conditions threaten fisheries in the Pacific Northwest. And so this is an example of Dungeness crab uh, suffering with a mass die off from hypoxia. And so I do have a project here um, with uh, Jack, Francis, Jeremy at Sexton, um, Kip Shearman and, and Jan Newton at UW, um, looking at fishing for epoxia, so it's an academic and industry tribal partnership to observe the coastal ocean. And I'm not gonna go in detail with this project, but I also wanted to highlight the work that my students do. So here I'm showing Matt Noto, who's part of the marine resource management. And so he is the student working on this project. So you'll see throughout the presentation, I will have these little highlights of um, 
my students to, who are all very new, they're all in their second year, but at least you'll have an idea of what we do, but mostly what they do. Um, and also there are work here, there's work here being done at OSU on how oysters may be affected by acidification. And many of these species that I'm outlining have larval stages that are mostly vulnerable to ocean currents, so they don't really control where they go horizontally, but they can move up and down. Uh, so here we have uh, crab and oysters, uh, the larval stages. And so these larval trajectories where the ocean currents bring the larvae will determine dis dispersal and recruitment, which was, we're all very familiar with, but also the ocean conditions they encounter. And so here you have uh, two screenshots taken from Nanus, and I will try to remember to use the pointer for the people online. On the left, we have surface chlorophyll concentration on the coastline and bottom oxygen concentration here. And what you can see is that the, the distribution of these concentration is fairly patchy, right? So if the organisms are close to the surface, um, depending where they are in space, they'll have higher or lower phytoplankton concentration, which may serve as food, and higher or lower bottom oxygen concentration, which can be detrimental. So the adult crabs are stuck in one place, but not the larval stages. Um, and I'd like to here highlight the work of uh, Hallie Berger, who developed a scheme where she can use particle trajectories and models so she can simulate these larvae and their movement and sample ocean conditions along their path to have a sense for how their, state, their life stages might be affected. But she's also added this extra step of having kind of a vulnerability assessment on top of that pathway. So I think that's really some uh, approach that we should consider and that I would be happy to embrace. So I'm highlighting here her work. And so we have the adults that may be in crab pots <laughs> that may or may not have dissolved oxygen sensors if they're crab pots we work with. But there's also this whole larval stage. So the crabs, maybe you look at the conditions in one place, but not for the larvae. And so here, without worrying about the detail of this, this schematic, what um, I want to highlight is that she can use this ocean model to look at the bottom conditions, but also where the larvae go and what the conditions are experienced by these larval stages. And so um, seminal work here about zooplankton moving up and down in the water column, experiencing different upwelling velocities can be moved closer towards shore or away from shore. And so the plankton vertical position and depth varying currents will control this cross shore transport. And we also have this uh, system happening in estuaries where you may have um, average show flows that are away from the river at the surface towards the river at the bottom. And so depending on life stages or, or just behavior, organisms can find themselves in, in different environment. And oysters will re respond to salinity levels and, and different species will end up in different places as a result. So these were two examples of cross-shelf transport. Um, and here there is a paper um, by Melissa Moulton here that outlines some there's only a few of the many transport processes that can take place, right? In the surf zone, there's wave dynamics, rip currents, uh, there can be Stokes drift. Then depending on the water heating and cooling, it can create uh, lateral movement, cross shore winds, internal waves, along shore wind, and we can go on. These are just the mechanism that she covered in her paper with some nice uh, back of the envelope calculations. And I actually, Jennifer, if I recall correctly, had input on parts of that paper. So, so she can tell you if it was good or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, boo, if I step out of the box. <laughs> um, so here, like this alongshore wind is what is, controls this upwelling system. Um, and what I'll cover is, is these internal waves that we hear a lot about, but hopefully I'll demystif demystify a bit for you. So here there's a time lapse um, on the left of the screen and I will time lapse of clouds rather than, than uh, waves. So that hasn't worked. Let me see if I can find a way outside of presenter view and if I can go to it. I don't know why it rescales. Is there a way for me to see? Full screen, it must be a Mac to Windows conversion. 
let's see. If not, you'll just have to believe me that there are internal waves. Yes, it may not be the case. So. Interpretive dance. <laughs> that will generate a lot of booing. <laughs> but let me see if I can do something that's like, play full screen. Maybe what if I take that off? No, it still does the same. All right, make sure you share screen again when you're ready. Uh, because it's not there. Okay, well, you won't see them move, but if you really squint, uh, and I have to reactivate my pointer, if you really squint just here, you'll see that there's kind of slicks of um, where the, the water surface is smooth and then rough, and smooth and rough. And these are um, a surface expression, they can be a surface expression of internal waves. There's uh, different reasons to have slicks, but one of them can be internal waves interacting with the surface. And what you would have seen in this video is you would have seen the surface waves going quite fast and these slicks moving much slower compared to surface waves. So they're not, they're not zipping by at the same speed as, as surface waves. They're much slower, but they're also much larger, right? They can be 10 meters in, in height in some places, uh, which so there you go. Now you can still see the clouds, which really doesn't help anything. But I'm not demystifying internal waves today. They remain a mystery. Um, so now let's see what happens when you swim in internal waves. Um, and so here is the picture of these slicks, but they, the picture was taken from a plane uh, during a, a bloom. So we have a red tide going on. And so these waves concentrated some of these uh, likely dinoflagellates. And so we can see the slicks being emphasized by the ocean color. And so these waves can concentrate plankton um, and they can also transport plankton towards shore. So um, there's been some seminal studies with Alan Shanks putting some drifters at the surface and, and they could move one to two kilometers on shore uh, in the time they were there. Other times they didn't move at all. And we think that this transport would vary with depth. So if you look here, you have a schematic with depth um, on the y-axis and the onshore, offshore distance on the x-axis. And I've just shown wave velocity. So the wave is moving towards the right. And then at the top, we have velocities that move in the same direction as the wave. And at the bottom, they move in opposite directions. So where the plankton would be would mean that they would all either be brought closer to shore or farther away from shore. So the main scientific question I asked was, can depth keeping promote onshore transport and internal waves? And I happen to have access to these plankton robots and we're working on uh, developing a new version that should be ready this summer. And so what they can do, these mini autonomous underwater explorers, is you can program a vertical behavior. It's not yet adaptive. We just tell it to maintain a certain pressure or move wet pressure. There can be up to 16 of them. Um, and they're tracked acoustically so we can get sub-minute positions, which is actually quite high uh, position coverage in underwater. And at the same time, they have a temperature sensor so they'll record ambient temperature. And so I explored two extreme behavior in internal waves, knowing that most organisms would be somewhere along that spectrum. You have here uh, the little dots show you Passive plankton, neutrally buoyant, they would just move up and down with the waves. So picturing the warm waters at the surface, the cold waters at the bottom, and the wave moving in this direction. You have, as the wave comes, the plankton just go move up and down with the wave, and they get transported a little bit. And if you're a swimming organism like the copepods, you might be able to stay at a fixed depth. And what this uh, schematic here shows is that if you move up and down, you stay in waters in the same temperature, but if you s resist the wave, then you, you cross temperature gradients. So we put the robots in these waves. Actually, it may not have been when that picture was taken, but ocean conditions were very similar in the sense that we did have a bloom. So we could put them where the, like, the rows were. We had the acoustic pingers around an array that's about 
a three kilometer in diameter. We deploy the AUEs in the middle. We have temperature sensor and velocities, and then we just saw where they went. So when I say we had temperature sensor and velocity, we had a nice uh, taut line with temperature sensors every meter in the vertical to get us a sense of ocean condition. And when a fishing boat gets trapped in it, that's what happens. You end up getting a picture in the email list serve about your mooring, which I have seen happen at Hatfield. So we are all uh, in this together. And so as I was saying to get uh, earlier, if you resist wave displacement, you might cross isopycnals and temperature gradients. And so here, when you're in the middle of a wave as a swimming plankton, you will experience kind of a warm ocean temperature, so uh, a positive temperature anomaly. And I'm reminding you of that because I will show you data of um, here, seven MAUEs deployed at depth. So they're at three meters depth. They're fighting any vertical velocity to stay at that depth. And you will then see the temperature that they experience um, with this colored dot, and you will see where they move. And so remember that this is all positions obtained underwater at, at GPS precision, but not with GPS. Um, so we'll look at it, and then I'll talk about it. It's more exciting when I narrate it. Um, so, and now we see the internal waves, not the clouds. So we have here um, the MAUEs. We're primarily going in the alongshore direction, right? That must have been the dominant ocean currents. And suddenly they get just picked up by this feature, which we now know is a wave, and brought on shore, right? So here there's this warm temperature uh, that they measure and boom, it, it really is quite significant, right? Over, that's 15, 20 minutes they were transported 30 to 70 meters towards shore. So if these waves are coming in all the time, it, and most of our models don't actually represent internal waves, then, then we may be missing a strong cross-shore transport um, in our estimates. So what happened? And I'll try to go quickly over this uh, just to give you kind of a picture of what the ocean looks like. So here, um, on the x-axis, you have time before the internal wave arrives at the mooring and depth. The MAUE is reminding you that they were deployed at three meters. Red is moving onshore and blue is moving offshore. So we have this vertical structure of the water column. We'll call these the background condition. And, and so that's just a cross-shore component. And you can see that AUEs were kind of in between onshore and offshore flowing water. So they were not really moving much in the cross shore direction. They were mostly moving in the alongshore direction. I'm not showing those velocities. And then at zero, here is where the center of our wave is. And what we can see is as the wave comes, these black lines are, are isopycnals. You can see that the wave is, first of all, a wave, right? It's moving up and down like we would expect. And I should have clarified that often internal waves are downward, right? If we are drawing surface waves, we'll draw them up like little peaks, but often internal waves are downward. Um, there can be both, but it, it's a matter of the, the ocean stratification. And so that wave came, moved the whole water column up and down. It displaced that layer of blue water down and potentially all the organisms that were in it, except if the organisms stayed nicely at three meters, then suddenly they experienced this really strong onshore velocity. And that's what we saw in our data. Um, so here, that's what I'm saying. If with these little arrows, if the organisms stayed at three meters, they experienced these strong onshore velocities. Whereas if they had uh, moved up and down, then they would have stayed with not very strong velocities. And because me dancing around is not as effective as if I show you a little animation, uh, I created a little animation and we have here um, a depth keeping organism. So you will see the, I think the black particle stay at a fixed step and the green particle move up and down and you will see what happens when the particle experiences the, the onshore velocities, which are in red. And so you have the wave coming into shore and boom, the green particles, the phytoplankton just moves up and down and is not experiencing this cross shore transport. Whereas the, the depth keeping organism can kind of essentially surf that wave, right? It just, for those of you who surf and paddle hard to catch the wave and get in, then that's what the, the organism has done by just 
experiencing the ocean velocity. It just, the ocean was so fast that it could ride the wave in and eventually it, it drops out. The ocean decides when it drops out though. Um, and so, because I do, actually, I told you that models don't often have internal waves. I still do work with models a lot. So I made a simple theoretical model to reproduce my observation and all models are alive, but they might tell you something that's useful. And so here, that was my observation. I cut out this wave and look with theory. I mean, I think that's pretty good agreement, right? Like that's a strong, strong correlation. Um, and so now that I had some mathematical a uh, description of this wave, I could play games of what if the organisms swim this fast and this slow, and, and what happens if I have steeper waves and all the waves that I observed during that time when I didn't have these um, robots. So I put these virtual larvae that I showed you in my schematic, some that were depth keeping, some that were passive. And so here on the x-axis, we have, oh, I have to look here, the vertical swimming speed of the larvae, so some that don't swim at all, some that perfectly keep depth and we saw the cross shore transport, what it would have been in the wave that we observed. And so essentially what you can see is that the more, the, the more you can keep up with the wave the displacement, the more onshore transport you experience, right? So up to a hundred meters of transport in a single wave. And then there was still 50 predicted from just this little bit of red. And if I put my MAUE observations on top of that, we can see that it's not on the line, but it's close enough and we can assess that the vertical swimming speed they must have had uh, close to what a, a larval barnacle might do. Um, and in fact, I was also able to calculate the, their actual vertical swimming speed from the, the robots. And so what the model predict they would have needed and what they actually did is, is very close. So we have had some faith that we had a simple characterization of waves. And now we said, well, what would happen over the two weeks that we were there and didn't have robots in the water at all times? So we have here a time series depth on the y-axis and you can see these like large up and down is the internal tide and the small like jagged lines, those are the like higher frequency internal waves, the one that the organisms we think might surf. And so I was able to isolate five, over 500 waves in, in two weeks and see what happens to organisms in those waves. Um, I put these little virtual larvae and I asked the question, what happens? And so here, um, it's a plot of the relative horizontal distance. So if you were passive as a larvae, I placed them, at, you know, it's relative to what a neutral particle would have done. So that's the line zero is where the virtual uh, passive larvae ended up. Any point in this, side of the panel will say that the depth keeping larvae got closer to shore. And if they're on the other side of the panel, it means the depth keeping larvae were kind of left behind or transported farther on offshore. And then I'm color coding the result we had at each depth. So that's the number of wave that had this observation. So here it's a bit hard to tell, but like darker colors are fewer waves, lighter colors are more waves. So we can see there's more waves here that were in this positive region, but there's still variability, right? It's not guaranteed what will happen. And now if I plot all of the, all of the depths and I'm highlighting the median and the 90th percentile, we can see that on average, having a vertical swimming behavior does lead to greater onshore transport. And so in our case, depth keeping was necessary for virtual larvae to experience transport comparable to the MAUE. So if you want this like 50 meters closer to shore, swimming is um, advantageous. If you're trying to disperse, being passive may make more sense. And we know that different larval stages may have different behavior or different strength in their swimming. Um, and about 20% of the waves transported depth keeping larvae at least 50 meters on shore versus 1% when they didn't do anything. So, so really it is something that we're not capturing in models. And so perhaps it would be significant, but there's other things models don't do. Um, and so coming back to this picture, I mean, I only focused on this little, little internal wave here. There's many other processes. So it's always a matter of like, what is most important, right? And we did calculate some estimates um, for different cross-shore exchange velocities. So it's specific to these conditions that were observed. 
and with this paper, one could plug in all of the conditions for their own environment. And what we saw is internal waves really, they were not the main contributor, right? They might add to the transport, but, but um, the effect of, of upwelling velocity might be stronger. However, despite the fact that I calculated those waves, I did not have access to background velocity. So it could be an underestimate. So, um, and by background velocity, I mean how the ocean moves. This was just the waves themselves. We were not considering that there's existing currents that could have been moved up and down like we saw. Um, so in summary for this section, the deformation of a fast surface layer by internal waves gave those little boosts to larvae, or in our case, robot larvae, um, which, which was kind of similar to surfing in. Depth keeping and internal waves did increase onshore transport. And so if we assume that those are suitable adult habitats, they, it could help recruitment. And a range in swimming behavior leads to, we always thought, right, that there can be like predator prey uh, separation in the vertical, but also if moving up and down leads to horizontal separation, then, then we could have uh, a mismatch in that sense, right? And that's what uh, has been seen with, with copepods and upwelling velocities, right? Different populations are in different places. And so now in terms of future work, uh, we are working on another version of these MAUEs that hopefully will be more user friendly. And so stay tuned, come talk to me here at Hatfield. I will, you will hear it when they come. I will show everyone and we'll get, very, well, I will get very excited. Perhaps you will also. Um, and I like to credit an intern that I actually didn't work with because um, we came up with this name of the vehicle for observing Lagrangian or larval transport, depending what you prefer. Um, so the Volt, and then one intern said, really, you should just boil it down to Le Transport, and it's a joke I've made a hundred times, but I find it funny every time. So, so really, I think we'll go with that as an official name. And I said I would highlight some of the work that my students are doing. So we have here Chad Gibson at, um, in CEOs. And so his dream is to use gliders to localize our floats. So um, <clears throat> In my case, we had this array, which was stationary. So once the robots were out of the array, that's it. The experiment was terminated. We thought we had four hours. Turns out we had two hours. Like it was very short deployments because, because we were out of, of acoustic range. And so he would really like to have gliders go around and communicate with the floats and, and try to localize them that way. So we'll try to make that happen. And now I'll give um, another example, a snippet. It'll be a bit shorter. It's all modeling based, but the behavior is inspired by lab observations. So it's to give you a sense for if you have larval behaviors, come to me and we will, we will, we can do something in models if you're interested. Um, so coming back to this example I gave earlier with um, the fact that larvae can move vertically in an estuarine system if their position is influenced by salinity, that can lead to different position in the estuary. Um, in our case, it's how the larvae responded to waves, but it's the same thinking that in general, there are tidal velocities, but there's also a mean flow that is in at depth and a mean flow that is out towards the ocean at the surface. And so that's a typical estuary. And now specifically Delaware Bay on the East Coast, we have something similar where at the bottom, the velocities are into the bay, and at the surface, they're out of the bay. But it's a real environment, right? Well, this model environment, but it represents a real environment. And so here where you're on the flats, it may be that the velocities are always in one direction, right? I'm just giving uh, give or take guidelines of, of what we see in the mean sense. And there are different um, theories that have been explained that the asymmetry in the tide essentially can mean that anything sinking like larvae that move towards the bottom or sediment, so settling larvae or sediment, uh, would have a tendency to move towards land. And so we decided to look at the implications for two closely related species that display different behavior and have different habitats to see if their behavior might connect to what they experience in their environment. And so these are all tank experiments all this is based on tank experiments, um, primarily conducted by Heidi Fuchs at Rutgers. And so what we can see here, we have this eastern mud snail and its cousin, 
the tree line mud, mud snail. And I put a little E to remind us that this little guy lives in estuary and this little guy lives on the shelf. So one is in a sheltered environment, the other one's on the shelf. Um, and so when this E larvae um, tumbles, it will tend to sink. So when it's experiencing turbulence or vorticity from the waves, it'll sink. But when it's being accelerated, and sorry, oh, people online might see me dancing here. But um, if it's being accelerated, it just does nothing. Like it doesn't respond to wave acceleration, but it will respond to this, this vorticity. However, the shelf species, when there's vorticity, they will also sink. And that might be an indication of the seabed. But when they are accelerated, instead, they will, they will tend to swim upward. So that's where their behavior differs. And so we were wondering if each of these behavior could be adapted to their native seascape. And so what is a seascape? I know many of you do, uh, do look at seascapes, so sorry if this is a, a repeat for some of you, but it's essentially how ocean environments can be characterized by their properties or flow signature. And in this case, I made a small schematic of an estuary as an inlet with, with small but steep waves and shelf that has these big long waves. And then we have uh, vorticity, right? So we have turbulence at the surface from the wind at the bottom. And so in estuaries, it might be the full water column, whereas in the shelf, there's kind of this quiet interior. And so vorticity or turbulence is stronger in estuaries typically. And surface waves, however, are much, uh, they have stronger acceleration on the shelf than in estuaries. So we could imagine that the organisms living in the estuaries might respond more to turbulence, uh, less so to waves and vice versa. So what would that mean? If we had both species in the estuaries um, and they sank because of turbulence, they might move towards the, the river mouth. Whereas if only, there's only one species that responds to acceleration and then it would swim up, and if it might find itself in, in surface currents, it could be expelled out of the, the bay. And so that could be ad, like advantageous. If you're an estuarine species, you, you don't really want to be in, in, though they don't have a choice, they just may have evolved that way. It's not advantageous to find yourself in surface currents that can flush you out of the bay, right? It would be more advantageous to have a behavior that keeps you in the bay where you reside, whereas the opposite is true for the other one. So we released virtual larvae in a regional model. The model was uh, created before I was there. Eli Hunter has a paper about it. So you have this large domain and then a, a small focused domain around Delaware Bay. Um, these are some, some specifications of the model. We use ROMS path, which is, uh, some might have heard about LTRANS. It's a particle tracking model that's been optimized for, for ROMs, and some, some improvements mean that, that it runs faster, and we can prescribe behavior to our particles. And so these are some details of what we did. It's all biologically informed. So the response to the values in the model, that's from models, uh, that's from experiments. When the larvae were released is based on, on experiments also, which found that around eight degrees Celsius is when the, the larvae are released. And then we just did hourly release over 10 days, had a total of very many larvae over many years, and we followed them for 60 days to give them the time to grow. So their growth was prescribed from temperature. So these are these realistic aspects of the larvae. They had temperature-based growth. Settlement was prescribed at competency, so when they were greater than 600 micron, they had to be close enough to the seabed, of course, because they can't just like, they could dive, but not that fast to the seabed. And, and the stress at the bed was too weak to just pull them off. And then I will only focus on three behaviors. We tried different things. So one is no behavior, then is the estuarine behavior and the shelf larvae behavior. So one is sink only, the other one is sink and swim up. So what happened for the particles that were released in Delaware Bay? And so we have the passive estuarine larvae, shelf larvae, and the average residence time in the bay. And so as predicted, sinking uh, increased the time spent in the bay by about you know, more than 10 days. So that's quite significant. 
and um, compared to being passive. But then if you added swimming up, you relative to sinking only, it reduced the time spent in the bay. So it is, if you must sink at some point to get to the seabed, then that's a sufficient behavior for the estuarine larvae. However, if there is a risk that we, you will get trapped in this estuary and it's not ideal, then adding the behavior of swimming up does uh, imply that you're more likely to get flushed back out to the shelf. And of course, residence time is not the only metric of success. We also looked at the competency in Delaware Bay, and here we have passive particles, the estuarine larval behavior and the shelf larval behavior, and the percentage of competent larvae in red is the bay. So having this behavior of swimming down meant that the larvae spent more time in the bay, were more likely to become competent in the bay. Um, however, adding the response to the waves reduced that, that inclination. But when we look at the shelf, we see the opposite, right? So the estuarine larvae were not as likely to become competent on the shelf as the shelf larvae. So this all makes sense. Um, and then looking at not only competency, but settlement, then we have here the same passive estuarine and shelf larvae, the settlement percentage. And again, there was more settlement in the bay with the estuarine larval behavior um, than without. And once we looked at the shelf larvae, there was also more settlement on the shelf relative to the other two, no behavior or estuarine behavior. There was still some settlement in the bay, which you know can happen. Um, we also were not setting them up for success because we released them in the bay, whereas their adult populations may be more on the shelf. Though some of some adults are found at at some depths here, right by the mouth mouth of the bay. So um, here, looking at at spatially what happened, I'm looking at the time that each larval behavior spent in the bay. So the the strong the darker colors show you spending more time in certain areas of the bay, right? So looking at whether they spent more time in the channel, and so we see that passive larvae mostly spent no time anywhere. Whereas these estuarine larval behavior, it not only retained the larvae in the bay, it also tended to push them on the side, on the flanks, and spend a lot of time. And if you went and sampled those mud flats, that is where the adult populations are found. So, so we have some confidence that, that looking at experiment data and putting that in a model, we get something that looks like the real world. So it's encouraging, and that allows us to ask questions about the future um, ocean conditions. And, and those papers are upcoming. And the shelf species also ended up pushed against the flats, but, but far less than, than the estuarine species. And to put that into what that might look like in terms of the path the larvae experience, uh, here you have the, the cold colors are early in the larval life, and then the warm colors are, are later. So here it's just the age. And so what you can see, I just picked one example where they were released close to the adult habitat of the estuarine larvae. The, the larvae are going back and forth with the tide. They get to the, the mouth of the bay, come back in, and then come out, right? So the passive larvae that was kind of typical, they get swished around. And at some point, they, they get pushed out. Whereas the estuarine larvae that responded to this vorticity, well, when they got to these big waves by the mouth of the bay, they sank, and then they would get pushed inwards uh, with those mean velocities. And you can still see it's jagged, right, because it's they're being swooshed by the tide, but still overall progressing in and ending up on the flat. Whereas the shelf larva got moved up and back and forth by the tide, and when it got to this area where there tends to be strong waves, oh, well, the behavior then was to swim up in those currents that go out of the bay, and whoop, it got flushed out. So these are kind of, I picked the nicest particles that illustrates the point, but it was not uncommon to, to see those paths. And so to bring this all together and head to happy hour, um, we have here, we made a plot of how we might think of, of what's advantageous to a larvae, so a larva. So here, uh, it's the number of days from competency to settlement, right? The quicker you can settle, probably reduce mortality and the percentage of larvae that settled within a population. And so pink is these passive larvae. So it took them longer to settle and not very many settled. 
Um, then the shelf larvae in the bay also took longer to settle and a little bit more um, settle, but not as many as if you have the behavior that's adaptive to the environment you're in. Then you settled quicker and more of the larvae settled. So in summary, uh, the response to vorticity only, so the estuarine mud snail larval behavior led to higher residence time in desirable habitats, faster growth because those waters were warmer and faster settlement. So all things that may uh, contribute to population success. And one thing that we didn't discuss is, of course, the strength of this behavior relative to how quickly the larvae are mixed is important. And I'm just gonna show that by waving my hands, not going into the details of what the paper covers. But if, if you're being stirred up and down and you're a weak swimmer, that won't really help, you'll be well mixed, right? But if you have a very strong swimming compared to, to how much you're getting mixed, uh, that you'll have more control over where you go. And that is something that Melissa um, emphasized in her paper is here on the x-axis, the more, well, those three panels, it's an increase in swimming ve velocity relative to this turbulence. And so if you're a really strong swimmer, well, you'll just, you'll just be able to stay in one depth and you'll go in, that, in the direction of the currents at that depth. However, if you have the other extreme here and you're a very weak swimmer and you're just mixed up and down by the tide, you know, it'll be more of a dispersive behavior. It's not gonna be a directed motion. And so different behaviors may be advantageous at different times, right? That, that might keep you in one place, that might accelerate you somewhere else. And I won't go into details of, of these notes. This is essentially what I've said, but if you refer to Melissa's paper, you can get some kind of estimates for where, where your larvae might go if you have numbers to plug in. So we'd be really curious to hear if that framework works for you. So take home message, vertical swimming matters. I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, in both internal waves and in Delaware Bay, this swimming behavior could help larvae reach desirable shallow water adult habitats. And passive particles, as some of us probably know, do not capture the transport and environmental conditions of the larvae and other swimming zooplankton well, right? Because there was an influence of temperature in the internal waves, and that's true. Um, as they move across the ocean. So now I'll leave you with a video, but I realize it's risky. Who knows if it will work? So here's Joe um, attaching a small salmon small to a different type of, of robot that goes in a, the ocean with Trevor Harrison here at APL. So these floats can do what our floats do. You can prescribe a depth and they can maintain that depth. So Joe was interested in knowing if, if the depth, if these floats go at a certain depth with a little salmon, would they be more or less vulnerable to predation? And it was a proof of concept mainly. I think we can see here a GoPro. Um, and so it recorded footage of this little salmon smold. And I'll show you the potential of, of what we can now start exploring. And I'll remove the cursor. So we have um, a rockfish passing by and just clearly the salmon smolt st stood no chance. Um, but what's really exciting is then we get this very interesting footage of the float staying with the fish, right? So we can be measuring ocean properties while the float is drifting with the fish. And so I think it's only a matter of time where the behavior can become adaptive, right? Rather than prescribing it at the surface, we can say, use image recognition and, and have a behavior that stays with, with these fish. They might not be able to turn around and go elsewhere though, but eventually maybe. This fish knows better. <laughs> it's like, stop tracking me. Um, and so I mentioned that I would also uh, introduce my students. So this is Leah, my, uh, my third student who's in her second year. And she'll be working with us to model juvenile salmon ocean entry using particle tracking and seeing how um, ocean condition in different years may affect their dispersal, survival, and hopefully uh, extrapolating that to future ocean conditions. So with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs>
Thank you very, very much. We're going to go to questions. You did stay in the box and you did a little interpretive dance. I so did. I, I cannot resist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to bounce back and forth between questions online and questions in the room. And it looks like we'll start with a question online. Go ahead, Roseanne. What is competency and how does it differ from fitness? Ah, that's a very good question. I did not define the jargon. Um, so fitness would be, and people in the room will have the more accurate technical definition, but it's essentially how well an organism uh, is adapted and, and survives. Whereas competency is really referring to when the larvae are ready to settle. So they may have to undergo some, some metamorphosis before they can settle. And so if they're too small, even if they're in a desirable habitat, they will, they will not stay there. They will not settle. And settlement is when, in the case of an oyster, for instance, it might be when they attach to a substrate and then will stay there as their adult form. So Great. very non-technical definition, but hopefully that clarified some concept. Good. Okay. Questions in the room? That's a good segue to my question, which is, I missed it, I think, or maybe you, I maybe I didn't, but I would think the shelf species would have a longer uh, larval duration, that they wouldn't be competent to settle. They'd be wanting to drift around more. Was there a difference in terms of timing or pelagic larval duration, I guess, is maybe that's the term, or in, at least it is in the fish world? So that is an excellent question that opens a can of worm that probably people will boo me in the room. Um, so what we found is that actually the pelagic larval duration that were estimated in the lab really did not get us to competency once we were in the model. And so, which is true, that's obviously uh, something that we can debate and I won't debate it. But um, our hypothesis is that the lab conditions are pretty static and they're just more ideal condition than what you might experience in the ocean. And so the larvae actually experience colder temperature than they might in the model than they would in the experiments and therefore grew slower. And so we had to bring, we had to start tracking the larvae for 60 days because often it could take them 30 days to get to competency, which I am told that is not usually what happens in experiments. Um, and so to answer your question, now that I've given this background, the shelf species were also in colder water in the model, typically than the estuarine species. So they do, they did have, they could have had different growth model, but even with the same growth model, their pelagic larval duration would have ended up being longer because they grew slower. And considering that, that the threshold, it was size for competency, there is research showing that that's maybe more flexible. What comp when competency arrives can be more flexible and influenced by ocean environments, um, but we did not address that. So I will not settle the debate of whether the pelagic larval duration in the model is right or in the lab is right. But what I would invite people to say is that I could perhaps provide uh, you know, an estimate of the ocean condition that larvae would experience. And what if we could control our lab conditions to mimic that a little bit better? Would we have our larvae die or would we have them take longer to get to, to competency? And so I don't do lab experiments. I don't know how easy that is to do, but if you're interested, I'm very curious. Great, Roseanne, looks like you have a question. Yeah, this is a multi-pronged question. So. If you want me to repeat a part of it, let me know. Okay, how important are these processes relative to upwelling versus downwelling? There are many introduced invertebrates that establish only in particular estuaries, for instance. Could variable seascapes of those estuaries be important? How do surf zone diatoms stay in place or to surf zone waters not disperse well. Okay, so I may ask you to repeat some question, some parts of the questions, but I'll, I'll try to answer. So one was about upwelling dynamics versus the internal waves, say, or the estuarine dynamics. And I would say that it's more of a last mile question, right? It also depends where the, the larvae live. So the copepod species that are more offshore, maybe the upwelling dynamics and how, how that moves closer to shore is more dominant for them. 
But the larvae that are really close to shore, which is many larvae are within this five kilometer band, well, they, they might not experience the upwelling dynamics as much, right? It might be a slower process. And instead it's these, these rather episodic waves that, that matter more, um, or it's the waves that get them to, that keep them in this environment that is good for them as opposed to drifting into offshore waters. So I think it could be that, you know, upwelling dynamics has larvae drifting offshore very slowly, but the waves are constantly nudging them back in. So it probably is a combination of these things. Then the other question was about the invasive species colonizing different estuaries. I do think that, yeah, if we have information on these species and their larval uh, stages, we could ask these questions, right? If there's more dynamic estuaries or, or preferential salinities. Um, the main work that I'm familiar with uh, when it comes to invasive species and estuaries is the green crab larvae. And, and so we've seen some some work with people modeling these larvae in, in estuaries. And what they found is it's, it's kind of a leapfrog effect is that it's not really that the larvae have a specific behavior for one estuary versus the other, is that it takes time for the generations to get to the other estuary. And so, so they could actually reproduce the timing of unfortunately how, how these species might like colonize new habitats with the behavior in, in a model. Um, but I'm like, there are as many species as a, yeah, infinite number. So, so I'm sure there is cases for, for everything. And then I really don't know what the third question was. I forgot. Um, th this was regard to surf zones. How do surf zone diatoms stay in place uh, or do surf zone waters not disperse well? Yeah, so actually I think surf zone is, like so dynamic that provided they're robust enough to get tumbled all the time, uh, they they are likely, the waves will only come from offshore and shore, right? So it's an environment where they will really stay. Um, the rip currents could get them out, but my, my guess is that the majority of the population is just tumbled in, in the surf zone and, and mostly staying there. So I would think that that might be a tough environment to live in, but perhaps once you're there, you stay there. Um, but I could be proven wrong. All right, questions in the room? Well, um, great talk. Really interesting to see, you know, that, you know, some of the modeling and experiments are, um, you know, along the lines of some of the critters that you're looking at. Um, I guess I've got a couple of questions. One is about your um, uh, your little uh, robots. Um, you mentioned that they are depth staying, but really, aren't they technocline staying? Because you know, it's 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 uh, you know density that's driving it, which includes both temperature and salinity. Um, so that's one clarification question. And I guess my other question is about, um, are, do you have any plans to look at um, uh, some of the other larval fish, like uh, things that, that may be affected by, um, Quite a variety of things. I mean, there's a lot of things that are look that are important right now with offshore wind and its effect on currents and uh, you know at various depths. And um, there's a lot of species that are um, out in those areas. And I'm thinking particularly about coastal pelagic species. So, any plans to look at any of that? So these are two great questions because then I get to share my dream with you all. Um, so the first question, the answer is that the robots themselves have a pressure sensor and so they know at which depth they are and so the behavior was programmed to maintain that pressure. Now how they did that is the process that you described. They had a small piston that they can move up and down which adjusts their buoyancy relative to the water, right? They're either slightly lighter and start rising or they make themselves more dense and start sinking. 
And so that's all a control algorithm. So we don't have these big swings, though we did see some big swings in early tests. Um, and so what makes them change their buoyancy is their des program desire to stay at a fixed depth, but then how they do that is with buoyancy. So it's kind of a little bit of, of the two things you were describing. And so when we are thinking of having these neutrally buoyant versions of these organisms where, where you can prescribe one behavior or the other, we, we are thinking of, you know, you can use the picnocline and hold a steady density, and then you would just be moved uh, up and down as the water would be. And so in that case, it would just be about maintaining a constant density, not trying to seek to maintain a fixed depth. For short enough periods of time, keeping density is, is good enough for passive. Over time, that's not good enough because the waters could warm, right? But, but we're not at the point of having multi-day deployments or even 24-hour deployments until we have the gliders tracking our larvae. And then now the exciting question, which was about any plans to include other species? Well, my dream is to have a library of species behavior, right? So I do not do lab experiment. I, in fact, know very little about organisms unless my colleagues tell me. Um, but I'm very good at summarizing that into small equations that we can put in models. And so what I would really like to see is a collective um, effort to, to kind of compile as much information as we have about the species that we're interested in here, particularly off the coast of Oregon, and really leveraging everyone's expertise and saying, well, I know how these species grow with temperature. I've seen those papers, or I know how they behave, and kind of compiling that into a, a coding library so we can really identify gaps which might direct some future experiments and where then it can be plug and play, right? Like some people's students can come to me and say, I have all this, like I did a thorough literature review. Here's how the organisms behave. Let's put that in a model and let's look at where it goes and, and just collecting that information and making it publicly available to, to people. I think that would, you know, I, I'm, the students are really interested in particle tracking. And if we could get a framework that people can come and plug and play where it's not so inaccessible, I think that could be really fun. So that's my dream. Okay, we're going to take one more question because we're getting close on time. It could end on my dream also. Thanks, Jessica. That's really interesting. I have a question sort of about the mysterious internal waves from a biologist's perspective. <laughs> so, um, you know, you mentioned the fact that, you know, your drifters or your little robots flew out in half the time you expect them to be there. And I, I guess I'm assuming that had you left them out there longer, the passage of the next internal wave would have push them again in the same direction, but I just wanted to make sure that the that the behavior that you expect from the, the movement driven by the internal waves is actually con intermittent, but unidirectional and not actually bidirectional. Is that right? So that is exactly what did happen in some cases that I'm not showing just because it's not as clean a signal, but we could see just these nudges, right? We saw these kind of, I called it ratcheting, right? The, the organisms were being pushed. And so it is really predominantly unidirectional. Um, and we think that that layer was a wind accelerated layer. So it was going in one direction, moved down. So the waves are moving one way, the wind is moving another way. And that was really emphasizing everything. There could be the other case where if that wind layer was going in the reverse direction, then maybe the waves and the wind would have fought each other. But because they would not be together, it wouldn't cancel out as much as when like it's two in one direction or opposite direction, like this is still stronger. So on average, you know, if, if you just drop something in the water, th whatever happens that one wave, it could be the other way around or lesser, um, less towards shore. But on average um, in, in the, like when you consider a few waves passing by, it would be predominantly on shore. And, and it may correlate well with like episodic recruitment events, right? When the wind and the waves are together, then the organisms really go far and that's when you see your huge rec recruitment. But there, there were some thoughts, we had these um, pelagic crab, tuna crabs, which are my favorites, but they do get to the beach and are pretty stinky when they die. Um, and, and one day, you know, they, they're not there and one day they just covered a whole beach, right? So are they kind of suspended in the water and when you have just the right condition and the waves bring them inshore, is that what's happening? I would be really curious to have long time series to be able to say that, but 
we're sampling at two hertz, right? So <laughs> like to have instruments that are in the water sampling frequently enough to just catch everything as we, two weeks was as much as we could have things in the water and we deployed robots like twice a day to try to get what we could. But it, we're still not at the point where we'll have a huge, I mean, there has been some huge efforts to have characterization of, of internal waves, but it's not yet combined with, with the frequent biological ex observations that we would need. So lots to do. All right. I think I heard a couple of things, collaboration opportunities um, and opportunities to go and socialize after today's talk. Uh, going to... Joe, where are we going? Where are you going? To beer one. Beer um, one. So an invite to beer one if you want to continue the uh, conversations. But let's give a hand one more time for our speaker. All right, everybody, hope to see you next week and maybe this weekend. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, how are you? Yes, I mean, yeah. All right, everyone online, we're going to end the presentation. Thank you so much.